Welcome to the Orthodontics in Conference podcast, where Farouk brings you the summary of key lectures from orthodontic conferences around the world with your host, Farouk Ahmed. Hello all, and welcome to day three of the Saudi Orthodontic Clear Aligner meeting. In this podcast, we're going to cover the final six lectures, which have a variety of topics, from class two correction, class three correction, looking at image line first, tips for clean check, and also looking at the SLX aligner. And I'll join you guys at the end to go through my reflections on day three. Hope you enjoy the episode, and please do subscribe and look forward to the next episodes. This lecture is entitled Biomechanical Protocols and Strategies for the Correction of Sagittal Malocclusions. This is part one and two by Juan Carlos Verrero Lasmez. Juan Carlos started off by describing different methods of correction of the class two malocclusion. He describes sequential distillization, arch expansion, IPR and extractions, and also orthognathic surgery and class two elastics. He starts off with sequential distillization, describing the so-called V-sequence, essentially distillizing the posterior tooth half the space into it, and subsequently the next tooth goes starts to move half the distance into the space. He described the intrusion of deep bite cases, and he mentioned that we cannot intrude in sizes if the roots are positioned labial, and he described a two-stage approach to these deep bite cases. And this requires labial crown torque or lingual palatal torque first to ensure the roots are in bone, followed by the intrusion force itself. Juan Carlos went on to describe expansion and using differential approach to expansion, again a staged concept, expanding on the first permanent molars to begin with, then followed by expansion on the anterior teeth, especially in imisline first cases with primary dentition. He described how premolar extraction cases are very challenging cases, but he put it into context as to which movement is challenging. With the liners, it's the mesialization of teeth which are challenging to achieve. He described the use of herbst appliances as auxiliaries or adjuncts to the use of aligners, correcting the sagittal relationship. However, there are lateral open bites which are left. But he mentioned how Invisalign can be ideal for this by utilizing cutouts on both the sixes and the fives and applying box elastics. Looking at class two subdivision cases or asymmetric class two cases, he mentioned the etiology has to be considered in detail and how the differential growth of the mandible usually tends to be the culprit. The treatment for this is to mesialize the lower posterior segment on the affected side not to dislize the upper molar. And he mentioned that mesialization can be achieved effectively with class two elastics and aligners. In Qualis's second part of his lecture, he looks at class three cases. And he mentioned how posterior crossbites are common. Aligners can be incorporated into the correction of these by utilizing cross elastics. Palatal cutouts can be requested and patients can wear elastics from the upper posterior teeth palatal aspect to the buccal aspect to the lower posterior teeth. Now he advised when it came to using elastics, 128 grams of force is ideal, but this all depends upon the distance that the elastic has to traverse. So he mentioned for short class two elastics or or cross elastics, he uses a three millimeter diameter elastic. For inter arch elastics, a larger diameter of 4.5 millimeters. He described how to utilize the elastics onto the aligner, and he recommended using hooks on the anterior teeth or the canines, and using cutouts in the posterior segment with metal buttons. He described an orthognathic case, which had a fantastic outcome, and he said that aligners are really effective at providing the pre surgical preparation. Post surgically, rather than having appliances on the teeth, actually what can be utilized are mini screws. And this allows the setting to take pace with the use of intermaxillary elastics. He described a really interesting class three case that he managed. This patient had all of their dentition in place, including their erupted third permanent molars. He wished to create four millimeters of space within the arch and IPR wasn't enough. So he decided to hemisect the third permanent molar. The tooth was root canal treated and he generated four millimeters of space. And in that he was then able to correct the malocclusion. Looking at interceptive treatment, Juan Carlos described, well, actually young patients can very much adapt to utilizing Invisalign and aligners. 
he demonstrated a six-year-old which had a class three relationship. And he described typically he'd be using rapid maxillary expansion for disjunction of the maxilla, and then using a chin cup approach. But he said now with Invisalign and aligners, he can incorporate this correction utilizing aligners alone. Describe the use of multiple attachments for retention of primary teeth and the use of class three elastics. This lecture is entitled The Keys of Sagittal Treatment with Aligners. This lecture was by Isabel Flores Allen. She looked at class 2 correction and she described the options of using aligners for its correction. Molar derotation, interproximal reduction, distalization and utilizing class 2 elastics and extractions. And she started off by looking at upper first molar rotation as part of correction for the class 2 cases. And I think this is sometimes missed out of the arsenal for class 2 correction. Why does a first molar rotate medially? Well, she described how it takes the position of the first of the second primary molar. This correction can be achieved. Now, if we require a derotation, which is 20 to 30 degrees, she recommended using an attachment. Anything beyond 30 degrees, Isabel described utilizing auxiliaries such as force couples with buttons and attachments. For interproximal reduction, the maximum that we can achieve is 0.5 millimeters on the clean check. But what Isabel mentioned was to always look at the Bolton's discrepancy, and if there is one present, to factor that into our clean check. But it's not simply about analyzing the numbers, it's about where the discrepancy then occurs. And if this discrepancy is in the posterior segment, we may need to focus our IMPR in that segment. She went on to describe sequential distalization and how it is a predictable form of creating space of between two and four millimeters, especially in our younger patients. She described how it works. Essentially, it's sequential. So the posterior tooth distalizes first about halfway through to the space. Then this first permanent molar distalizes halfway into the space. And she gave a great tip here. She said no more than two teeth should be distalized at the same time, the so-called V protocol in staging. She also incorporates an aesthetic start. And what is an aesthetic start? Well, it's essentially correcting the rotations or the spacing in the anterior teeth. So the patient is receiving an aesthetic benefit to their treatment from the very outset. She described the use of class two elastics from the outset. Uh, and she described the key point to use it is when the fives begin to distalize to ensure we don't lose traction. Now there's always a debate which is mentioned and Isabel described the precision cut versus the cutout and the button. She described how she differentiates between using these two different appliances. And she described how the cutout is used to retrocline the upper incisors. When retroclination of the upper incisors is not needed, then she favors using a cutout with a button. Isabel went on to describe premolar extractions and how anchorage still plays a factor in how we make these decisions. If we need to have high anchorage, well, up to two millimeters of posterior mesialization will still be achieved, regardless of what the software tells us. So if we need to have greater control of anchorage, then we need to incorporate temporary anchorage devices into our planning. She described the typical changes she makes to a clean check, and she demonstrated this quite clearly. She spoke about how precision cuts on the upper second premolars are incorporated with class two elastics, because that is a stage when we can start to lose traction when we are distalizing. She described that when the first premolar begins to distalize, she changes to conventional attachments on these teeth. With Invisalign, we can't have a cutout as well as having an optimized attachment. So she goes conventional. She went on to describe that when the canines are then being retracted, she also replaces the optimized attachment on the canine with a conventional attachment, allowing absolute control of these teeth during the distalizing process. She described the use of vertical attachments on the upper sixes and sevens during this distalizing process. As she mentioned with class two elastics, the lower molars may measly tip. And she described using mesial attachments on the sixes to upright these teeth. She gave a tip about the elastics that she uses. Now she uses 4.5 ounces and she uses three over 16th to achieve her correction. This lecture is entitled Invisalign First After 50 Cases. This was by Pedro Costa Monero. And these were his experiences of using Invisalign First.
He described why, misal- why phase one is an important clinical application for him in his practice. He described that it allows him to be airway centric, focus on TMJs, look at the smile arc and maximize mandibular growth. Now, you mentioned that how with aligners, attachments are important, and that's still true for the use of phase one. He described how most teeth are still require it, and even more so than for adult patients, because the crowns are small in the primary dentition. He mentioned how 75% of clean checks are accepted with the first clean check produced. And he mentioned how this should not be the case, as a technician does not have the knowledge base of biological and aesthetic consequences so we should be modifying our clean checks he gave an example of a class 2 case and he spoke about how in the first clean check they retracted the up incisors but actually after considering the aesthetics the patient could have the patient benefited from mandibular advancement using the ma appliance with invisalign he spoke about bilateral cross bites and how rme can be incorporated first then followed by aligners and he says that he waits six months in between these phases to allow setting to occur. He spoke about expansion protocols just using the aligners. Now, there's a few different options. One of simultaneous expansion, where it all takes place at the same time. But also a staged approach, where the first permanent molars are expanded initially, utilizing the rest of the arch for anchorage, then followed by ut- utilizing the first permanent molars as anchorage to expand the rest of the arch, the two-stage approach. His clinical tip was to control torque or motors to use a horizontal attachment of 4 millimeters. This lecture is entitled How to Plan the Perfect Clincheck. This was by Pedro Costa Monero and Isabel Flores Allen. They recommended their five key stages to getting the perfect clincheck, and it was the following one, to review the final position, the first thing we should do. The second thing is looking at the IPR. The third is looking at the staging of the tooth movements. The fourth is looking at attachment design. And the fifth is looking at overcorrection. Pedro started off by mentioning how a good clean check is dependent upon good records. And he mentioned how if we were to make mistakes, such as not having our occlusal shots with the mirror at the right angle, it means we may not be able to evaluate the bone that's present and therefore make mistakes in treatment planning. He also mentioned the actual photos are essential for the orthodontist to be able to work out which direction to move the teeth in, not just occlusal planning. When it comes to looking at the clean check, he mentioned that how we communicate with our technicians is a key factor, and he described how he does it personally. So for example, intruding an upper incisor, rather than just mentioning the term intrusion, he talks very specifically. He asked the technician to intrude 1.5 millimeters on the upper right one. He said, we have to ensure we are planning with the end in mind from the very outset. He mentioned how the final positions he will then change. He will look at the first clean check, and look at, for example, the upper incisor position at a line of four and tell the technician to complete the treatment with, the ali- with that tooth in that position. Therefore, when the technician sees it, he'll ensure that the torque and tip for a line of four are present right at the end of treatment. He gave a key tip of keeping the biology in mind. Now, what Pedro does is that he takes a cone beam CT for all of his patients so he can make a detailed analysis of this, which I thought was an interesting way of incorporating that into his planning. He spoke about monitoring the progress, and he said that the ClinCheck itself represents a full system. So although we may not get true tracking with respect to tooth movements, actually if we've over-engineered the ClinCheck, we're looking at something different inside the mouth relative to what we see on the screen, and that is good planning. He mentioned about interproximal reduction. And in some cases, IPR, we can do prior to tooth movement, but in some cases, we do need to align the teeth to a degree before we can carry a safe and reasonable IPR. And this is round tripping, but he mentioned that we just need to factor that in. And if we are going to do it, we have to embrace the idea for the right case. He described that it is up to the clinician to choose at which stage and which teeth take the IPR and not to leave that to the technician. And he's very prescriptive about this. 
He also described overcorrection. Now, there's two ways of overcorrecting when it comes to space closure. And he described the difference. C chain is used for space closure between three to three, but power chain simulation is for when we require space closure from six to six. Now, Flores came in and she described how changing off her liners is also key, and she just changes that depending on the package. So, for her light or I7 cases, she will ask the patient to change their liners every 10 days as opposed to every seven days for her full cases. And she described a really interesting case with a scissor bite affecting an entire quadrant. And she mentioned here we've got to intrude the teeth before we correct the scissor bite. She should plan this with auxiliaries utilizing TADS. And she described how this then played into her line of planning. She asked for the no movement to take place on the teeth apart from the intrusion. And it was at a quicker rate than it would be with the aligner. She also built in positive torque to the posterior teeth. And she said, well, sometimes it can be difficult to work out what these numbers should be. And she said, well, simply looking at the symmetrical teeth or the contralateral teeth, we can get a, a good look as to where the teeth should be finishing to achieve symmetry. For intrusion of an upper posterior segment, so what Flores uses are three buccal tads, and she places elastomeric chain from cutouts and buttons on the teeth to the tads, keeping the mechanics simple. She also spoke about the use of cross elastics for this particular scissor bite case. Now here she had lingual cutouts from the lower first premolar to the lower second molar, and also in the upper posterior segment buccally as well, and ran her cross elastics. She described how if there's a tooth size discrepancy, we should be homing in as to where we wish to add the tooth substance for the patient. And if it's around the lateral incisors, that's where we should focus in leaving space. Now she gave some tips about calibrating our extra photos to the true horizontal, looking at the initial positions of our dental midlines relative to our facial midlines, and the final position of our incisor ledges. This lecture is entitled A New Paradigm for Clear Aligner Therapy by Mario Chirok. Now this was an interesting lecture. Mario used to be a platinum provider of Invisalign and then set up his own aligner called the SLX. And he describes some key differences between SLX and other aligners out there. He described how the fit is different. Now what's interesting is that although the aligner is 3D planned, actually it's printed on hard models. And he said that how the plaster models allow for better fit for the thermoforming material of aligners. He described the trim is different to other aligners. It's not going to be gingerly trimmed. Actually, it goes beyond the gingiva and incorporates the interproximal areas of the gingiva. And this provides greater retention and application of forces with the, with the material. He described how the material used in SLX is stronger than some of the other materials out there and has less staining. Now, he mentioned that when it came to planning it, it's a very malleable software to use. We can change the attachments, we can change other components of staging, but also the velocity of tooth movement can change depending on what we want to do. So it's very open to the user dictating how things work. His own tips were at the end of an aligner series to have two passive aligners. And I thought this was a really interesting idea. He mentioned this was to allow the production time for refinement aligners whilst the patient still has some new aligners to wear. He described some cases that he then treated. Now, this aligner has not been on the market for too long, but there were interesting cases nonetheless. And he showed some cases with no attachments when in other aligner companies, attachments may well have been required specifically looking at premolar derotation. He described how this particular aligner fits in well with the 3D carrier appliance. Now both those are used through Henry Schein. He described a staged approach, first using the carrier appliance to correct the sagittal class two discrepancy and then going and using aligners. He spoke a little bit about the carrier appliance, how it distalizes its teeth, uprights posterior teeth and creates anterior spaces. And that brings us to the end of day three of this Orthodontics in Congress podcast. I think the Saudi Orthodontic Aligner meeting has been a great success. We've had a variety of speakers talking about different topics within aligners. And this brought me and hopefully yourselves completely up to date as to our understanding of where aligners are today. I hope you guys have enjoyed this episode. Please do subscribe and look forward to the next episode.